this week, I want to look at a very strange question. Where in the universe are we? It's a bit of a strange question because, after all, everybody knows where we are. We inhabit a sort of mediocre second-rate planet called the Earth, which circles around an average sort of second-rate star called the Sun, which circles around an average medium galaxy called the Milky Way, which circles around an average medium sort of cluster of galaxies called the local cluster, which is lost in the vastness of space like a grain of sand in the Sahara Desert. The secular humanists love to say, even if there were a god, he'd never be able to find us. <laughs> well, that's the way we look at things today, but it wasn't always like that. There was a time when people used to believe the Earth was the center of the universe. And they did that simply because Nobody has ever experienced anything else. And the idea that the Earth was the center and everything went around it in circles like this carried on in educated people's thinking until relatively recently. Even when science was on the rise, scientists still believed the Earth the center. And one of the reasons is that science grew up in a Christian setting, particularly in Western Europe. And all the countries there were Christian and all the people at least nominally took the Bible as the ultimate authority. And everybody accepted that the Bible clearly put the earth at the center. For example, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and by the third day the earth is pretty well as we know it now with land and sea and vegetation trees plants and it wasn't until the fourth day and god said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the night from the day and let them be for signs and for seasons for days and for years so the earth is pretty well much as we know it on the third day the sun and the stars aren't created until the fourth. And there's no indication that the Earth suddenly starts moving around any of those bodies that are created on the fourth day. And not only that, it was taken that verses like Psalm 93 verse 1, the world also established that it cannot be moved, pointed to a stationary Earth. And while it all gives the impression that the Earth doesn't move, it gives the impression everything else does. For example, in Deborah's song, she talks of the stars in their courses. So the stars have got a course. And then Psalm 19 talks about the sun. And it says, his going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. So the sun has a circuit. The stars have circuits. Nowhere does it mention the earth has a circuit, it just says it still and cannot be moved. Well, the simple picture that we looked at on that first picture of the planets just going around in circles didn't work as soon as people started taking observations. One could see that couldn't be true. So that idea had to be modified and the most successful modification was made by a man called Ptolemy. And he put forward a model where the Earth is the center of the universe and everything else, the moon, the stars, the planets, the sun, go around an epicenter, which is not quite at the Earth, but a little distance away. And they go around and they travel around a circle doing another circle called an epicycle. Quite a complicated motion. And they move in such a way that the speed is less when the body is far from the Earth 
and the speed is greater when it's close to the Earth. So it was a pretty complex system, but very accurate. And that method was used for calculating planetary positions right until the time of the Renaissance. And in the Renaissance, there was an interest, a revival of interest in the ancient wisdom of Greece and Rome their philosophy, their art. And one of the people involved was Nicholas Copernicus. And he particularly was interested in two of the ancient Greeks. Plato, who said the sun was the embodiment of everything good and noble in the universe. And Pythagoras, who said the sun should be the center because it is the most magnificent of the gods. And one of his pupils came up with a model of the universe in which the sun, not the earth, was the center. This model, this idea that the sun is the center of the universe and everything else goes around it, is an old idea. It was kicked around by philosophers and, and astronomers for a long time, but it was rejected. One of the reasons was that most of the scientists were Christians and they believed the Bible instead of the ancient Greek astronomers. But Copernicus, being a fan of Pythagoras and his disciples, resurrected it and he said he could make it work. And he gave the impression that he could have the sun at the center of the universe the earth, the planets, the stars, everything moving around it in perfect circles without slowing down. So they move in a to constant speed. So his method is much better. Well, most people thought he meant he was working on a picture like this. But his book in which he described it was so badly written that almost nobody got past the opening chapter in which he gave the impression this was his model. But the few people who did get further, they discovered this wasn't actually true because the center of the universe, he had to have the center of the Earth's orbit. And he had to have all of the planets doing more epicycles than Ptolemy. In fact, Mars had to do five epicycles. It's got a circle within a circle within a circle within a circle all going around the sun. And it still was not as accurate. It wasn't really a very good model. Now we are told that the Catholic Church had a big down on him for his un unscriptural stand. Well, in fact, it was all the Christians who were down on him. Martin Luther, speaking of Copernicus, spoke of that fellow who wishes to turn the whole of astronomy upside down, even in these things which are thrown in disorder. I believe the Holy Scriptures. See, everybody realized that this idea was completely against the Scriptures. And it did not become popular until a genius came on the Scene. But let's just first see what Gordon Clark said about it. The Copernican construction could not predict or describe so accurately as the Ptolemaic system. Scientific observation was definitely more favorable to the old than to the new. But science is not all observation. Copernicus rejected Ptolemy on aesthetic grounds and not because of any failure to account for the observed facts. Yet when he arrived at his own conclusion, he took the position that at last the real truth had been found. Now this is a very common position in science. When somebody puts forward a brainwave, a new idea, he is utterly convinced now he's at last found the truth. And everybody who came before, well, they just didn't have it. But the person who came after Copernicus, who took it up, was Galileo. Now, Galileo was a bright lad, and he was a genuine scientist. He did lots of work in mechanics, and that work 
convinced him that Aristotle's physics was wrong. Now, Aristotle's physics had been accepted for 2,000 years. Nobody had ever tested it because people didn't do experiments. But Galileo did. And his experiments showed that Aristotle was wrong. And Aristotle was being taught in all the universities in Europe. And Galileo started a campaign to bring down Aristotle. And he was a very good debater. And he loved making his opponents look stupid. And when he came across Copernicus's system, he realized he had a tool against Aristotle. Now, Aristotle covered a huge area of knowledge in his thinking. One of the things he dealt with was with astronomy. And he had the universe moving in crystal spheres. Now, this is a very simplified diagram. It's not really his system, but he gives an idea. There is an outer crystal sphere with the stars fixed to it. That's called the stellatum. And then there are inner crystal spheres with the planets and the sun, and they all go around the Earth in the middle. When he saw Copernicus's model, he said, this refutes Aristotle, so he supported it with all his might. And in supporting it, he drew the attention of the Catholic Church, who were very interested. There were, there were a lot of very good scientists in the Catholic Church, and they said, well, look, it's interesting, this story that you're putting forward. Write an account putting forward the advantages of your sun-centered system and compare it with the earth-centered system, and let's see which is the most convincing. But he didn't do that. He wrote a popular little book instead of a scientific treatise. And that little book was a discussion between a really bright chap, you can see this was Galileo himself, and he's putting forward the sun-centered universe. And he's got an idiot putting forward the earth-centered universe. And he put the Pope's words in the idiot's mouth. So he became very, very odious to the Pope and the Catholic Church in general. They had commissioned him to write a scientific report, and he writes a popular little book making fun of the Pope. <laughs> so he got into trouble. But he realized from the start that his son centered system was anti-biblical. He wrote to one of his pupils and said, in questions concerning the natural sciences, holy writ must occupy the last place. Now, until that time, the scriptures had occupied the first place in everything. Galileo's dictum has come true to an extent that Galileo would never have believed. Now, in science, Holy Writ has no place at all. Well, we're generally given the impression that Galileo was called up to defend his solar system against Ptolemy. Well, he was actually called to defend it against Tycho Brahe's system. Now, Tycho Brahe was one of the greatest observational astronomers that ever lived. He spent his whole life taking the most accurate, by far, measurements of the position of the sun, moon, planets, the stars, by far the most accurate measurements that had ever been taken. And he came to the conclusion that the universe is actually like this. He said the earth is at the center. Two reasons. One, the Bible says so. Two, my observations agree with that. The moon and the sun go around the earth. Two reasons for believing that. One, the Bible says so. Two, my observations agree with that too. Everything else in the universe moves around the sun and is carried around the earth in the same way that the moons of Jupiter are carried around the sun. 
Now this is a model you've probably never seen before. As far as I know, it is the only proposed model of the universe which has never been refuted. But let's just go over it once again, since you've probably never seen it before. The Earth station at the center, the moon and the sun going around the Earth, everything else going around the sun and being carried with it as it goes around. <coughs> Rahe died before he could write up his observations. And he entrusted his observations to his assistant, Johannes Kepler, and Kepler promised him that he would write up his observations in the framework of that model we just looked at. Well, Kepler did mention that model. But he preferred Copernicus's model because he said it's simpler. Well, if you're just dealing with the sun, the moon, and the planets and the earth, it's true, it is simpler. It's not simpler when you get to the whole universe, but Kepler spent a lot of time working on Brahe's observations and came to the conclusion that the planets move around the sun, not in circles, but in ellipses, with the sun at one focus. Now that idea received a tremendous boost when the greatest scientist of all time, Isaac Newton, came on the scene. Newton had enormous powers of intellect. And he was the first person to think up the idea of gravity. Now this made it possible to do all sorts of things because you can imagine things working together under gravity. You can imagine, for example, a system ruled by the sun and call it the solar system. Until Newton, nobody could have ever imagined the solar system. There was no definition until gravity. Newton had the great insight to see that you can imagine just one or two bodies or a few bodies isolated from the rest of the universe. What would happen to two bodies if they were isolated the only thing working on it was the gravity acting between them? And then he worked out that if that was the case, the way they would move would be that one would move in an ellipse around the other one at the focus, one focus of the ellipse. And that gives you the easiest possible equations to show the relative positions of those two bodies. Now it doesn't matter if you consider the smaller body stationary or the large body stationary, you still get the same easy equations. Euler pointed out that really this wouldn't happen. What would really happen is both of them would move around their common center of gravity. And he worked that out. And he found, well, the equations are much harder, but the relative positions are exactly the same. It's interesting to see that the easiest equations do not apply to the real system. And the real system does not give the easiest equations. But the easy equations give you the relative positions perfectly simply and accurately. Now, if you've got more than two bodies, then it doesn't help to consider any of them stationary. The easiest equations are if you take the center of gravity of all those bodies, and then you work out the motion of all of them around that center. It is generally believed that we are part of a galaxy called the Milky Way that looks something like this. It's generally believed that the sun is about a third of the way out on one of these spirals. It's an insignificant little star that you wouldn't notice there. The Earth spinning around it and us going around that. If you want to look into the mechanics of the galaxy, the easiest equations occur if you take the center of gravity of the galaxy as stationary. 
But now it's believed that our galaxy is just one of a cluster of galaxies called the local cluster, and they're all spinning around. And if you want to do the dynamics of that, then you consider the center of gravity of the local cluster as being stationary. So what you consider stationary depends on how much of the universe you're looking at. Well, what if we want to look at the whole creation, all of it? Would it now be real, realistic to say, well, in that case, there must be some point, perhaps the center of gravity of the whole universe, which is actually really stationary? Now, if it's reasonable to think of such a point, what about the possibility that the Earth might be there? Well, has anybody ever had any genuine objection to that? Ernst <coughs> Mach was one of the greatest scientists of the 19th century. And he said, obviously, it matters little if we think of the Earth as turning about on its axis, or if we view it at rest while the fixed stars revolve around it. Geometrically, these are exactly the same case of a relative rotation of the Earth and the fixed stars with respect to one another. So here we have one of the greatest scientists of the 19th century who seems to have no objection to the possibility that the Earth might be stationary at that center. Now, Fred Hoyle was one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century. And he said, we know that the difference between a heliocentric theory and a geocentric theory is one of relative motion only, and that such a difference has no physical significance. So one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century seems to have no object to the possibility the Earth could be the center. Well, has anybody put forward any real objection to that possibility? There have been a number of ideas put forward as proof that the Earth cannot be the center. We haven't time to look at many of these. In fact, we've only got time to look at one. But they all go the same way. Let's look at the aberration of starlight. Well, you might say, what on earth is the aberration of starlight? It's an, it is something that was first detected by the British astronomer royal, James Bradley. Now, he pointed a telescope at rather a small star called Gamma Dac Draconis, and he observed its position throughout the whole year. And to his surprise, he found that it was never in its average position. It seemed to move around that average position in a tiny ellipse. This is very much magnified. It's actually very, very tiny. But it moved around in a tiny ellipse once a year. And he thought, why on earth is this happening? And about a week later, he suddenly thought, I know why. I've got the answer. It's because the Earth is moving around the sun. Now, why should he think that? The reasoning goes like this. You've got this telescope, and it's pointing absolutely straight at that star, its average position where it really is. And the light from that star comes and it hits the, the objective lens right in the middle. But it takes a little bit of time to get to the bottom. Not very much time, light moves very quickly, but the Earth is moving around the Sun at 100,000 kilometers an hour, and by the time the light gets to the bottom, this telescope has moved a little bit. So it's not in the center anymore, it's a little bit left behind. And since the Earth goes around the sun in ellipse once a year, the image in the eyepiece goes around in an ellipse once a year. Proof at last that the Earth goes around the sun. Now, the scientific community, since Galileo had taken it as the fact that the Earth does go around the sun, but nobody had had any proof. And Bradley said, here at last is the proof. But in those days, there were still people around who knew of Brahe's model. And they said, hey, wait a minute. If Brahe was right and the Earth is stationary, everything else is moving around in the sun as it goes in its elliptical orbit. 
then the stars are performing an ellipse in the sky. So we will see an ellipse in the eyepiece, not because the Earth has moved, but simply because they really are moving in an ellipse. And everybody said, hmm, well, yes, maybe it's not the perfect proof we thought of. And then an Italian, Ruggiero Boscovich, said, there's a way to test. All you have to do is fill a telescope with water. Because light travels one and a half times more slowly in water than in air. So, when this telescope is moving, it's going to go one and a half times as far before the light coming in at the top reaches the bottom. So the ellipse will be one and a half times bigger. Everybody said, yes, true. But we all know the Earth goes around the sun, so we won't bother to fill the telescope with water. So nobody did. Until a French scientist called Arago did some experiments in which he put a plate of glass on his telescope eyepiece, and he found that when he moved this, the image of the stars he was observing was dragged along with the plate. It was moved. And he could explain this if the Earth is stationary. He could not explain it if the Earth moves. He did other experiments with prisms. And again, he could explain those results if the Earth is stationary. But he couldn't explain it if the Earth moves. So the then British astronomer royal, George Biddle Airy, decided, well, maybe I'd better fill the telescope with water after all. Now remember, when this experiment was proposed, everybody agreed. If the Earth is moving around the Sun, this ellipse will be one and a half times bigger. If it's the same size, that means it is the stars which are doing the ellipse. As Tycho Brahe said. He filled the telescope with water, he did the experiment, exactly the same size ellipse. He had just proved the Earth does not move. But science isn't bound to accept an experiment. What happens is that scientists are very good at inventing what they call ad hoc theories. Now, I'm going to give you a, a rather silly example of an ad hoc theory just to give you an idea of the way an ad hoc theory works. Now, let's suppose we've got a scientist who has put forward a theory that all light sources must be yellow. That's the nature of light. And if you make a light, it just has to be yellow. Now, he looks out and he sees green light. Does he have to abandon his hypothesis that all light sources are yellow? No, he doesn't. He can say something has happened to the light from the source to my eyes. Maybe there's a plate of blue glass in the way. Something has happened to the light. It started off as yellow, but something has changed, so that now I see it green. Now, this is an ad hoc theory. And the ad hoc theory put forward to explain away Boscovich's experiment was that as the Earth moves through the ether, the fabric of space, it drags the ether along with it partially, just the right amount to make that ellipse the same size. Well, this ad hoc took away all the evidence, so now, again, we don't really know. Does the Earth stand still or does it move? And that remained the situation until James Clark Maxwell came on the scene. And he analyzed electricity and magnetism, he put forward his equations which completely solved the whole electric magnetism problem. And he showed that light has electric and magnetic energy which swap from one to another and the rate at which it swaps is constant if the, com if the properties of space are constant. 
Now that means it becomes possible to measure how fast the Earth is actually moving through space and how we can measure whether it is going around the Sun or not. The idea is that we know that light travels at a constant speed in space. The Earth is moving at a speed V and light is going at the same speed whether it's chasing after us or it's hitting us up in the front. So all we have to do is measure the impact speed of light and now we turn our apparatus until it gives us the biggest impact speed that shows us the direction we're going. Now, in order to measure the impact speed, one uses a diffraction grating. Now, the faster light hits a diffraction grating, the closer space the diffraction fringes. When light strikes a diffraction grating, you see a series of fringes. And the faster the light strikes it, the closer together those fringes are. So a physicist, one of the most brilliant experimental physicists that ever lived, A. a. Michelson, together with a colleague, Morley, built an apparatus to do exactly that. It's called an interferometer. We have time to go into it, but in effect, what they planned to do was to turn this equipment until they got the biggest fringe shift, and then they would know they were pointing in the direction the Earth is moving. So the fringe, the fringes they get from their diffraction grating look like that. And when they turn it, they should find in the direction the Earth is moving, the fringes come closer together. And the difference, the fringe shift, is a measure of the speed at which we are moving. The direction for the maximum is the direction we're going. So we can get the direction and the speed. And everybody said, wonderful. Then they did the experiment. And to everybody's surprise, no friendship. Everybody shook their heads, walking and going, well, what must be happening is the sun is moving around the universe at just the opposite speed to which the Earth is going around the sun. So the two motions have just cancelled out. But in six months' time, the Earth will be on the opposite side of the Sun. Now they'll be moving together, we'll get a nice big friend shift. So they looked in six months' time. Still no friend shift. Other people did the experiment. They did it in Germany, they did it in America, they did it on the tops of mountains, they did it all over the place. All times of the day and night, all times of the year, and always it's interesting to see what scientists have said about this. Adolf Baker, for example, failure to observe different speeds of light at different times of the year suggested that the Earth must be at rest. It was therefore the preferred frame for measuring absolute motion in space. Gian Colley said, but this implies that the Earth is somehow a preferred object. Only with respect to the Earth would the speed of light be seen as predicted by Maxwell's equations. This is tantamount to assuming that the Earth is the central body of the universe. And Bernard Jaffe said the data were almost unbelievable. There was only one other possible conclusion to draw, that the Earth was at rest. This, of course, was preposterous. So, of course, we have to look for another ad hoc theory. The physicists of the world were looking very hard, and a brilliant Irish physicist called Fitzgerald came up with the germ of an idea. He said, as a body moves through the ether, the pressure of the ether against it makes it squash up. It shortens the length. Now, the apparatus that they've got, when they point it in the direction that we're going, the ether squashing into it makes it shorter. That's why there's no fringe shift. Now that idea was developed by an even more brilliant physicist, Anton Lorentz. 
in Holland, and he developed his theory, it was called the theory of relativity. And there, not only did he have bodies being squashed and the length changing, he had clocks slowing down as they went faster. And using this theory of relativity, he was able to account for all the observations that showed the Earth stands still, so we could have it moving again. But then Thorndike and Kennedy did an experiment to check it out, and it didn't work. They still had the Earth stationary. So it was then up to a genius called Albert Einstein to change Lorenz's theory so that he would explain Thorndike and Kennedy. So now, instead of having bodies get shortened by pressing against the ether, he had space getting shorter. Now, what does that mean? He didn't have clocks slowing down because they're moving faster through the ether. He had time slowing down. Now, what does that mean? Well, whatever it means, it meant they could get over all the observations that said the Earth is stationary. So everybody said, terrific, good, we'll accept it. Even though nobody has ever actually understood it. Now, according to Einstein, we've still got the Earth hurtling through space at speed v. We've still got light impacting it with a speed c. On this side, the impact speed is c plus v but that is still equal to C. This light catching the Earth up, it arrives at C minus V, but it's still equal to C. Now, surely there's one solution. C plus V equals C equals C minus V means V must be north. The, north. the Earth can't be moving. But Einstein says, no, this is true for any value of V. Oh, my. Oh, well. At least it enables us to believe the Earth is moving, so let's believe it. But not everybody did believe it. There was a French scientist called Sagnac who said, now wait a minute, let's see if it really is true that C plus B equals C minus B. So he built a turntable, and he had a light source, and he had mirrors, it's actually not like this, his apparatus doesn't look like this, but this is a, a very simple illustration. And we have one beam going around clockwise, one beam going around anti-clockwise, and as long as this is not moving, we'll get no fringe shift. But now, if we spin this around, now we will have one beam of light chasing the motion, so it's going to arrive here at C minus V, and one going against the motion, it's, the impact speed will be C plus V. Now let's see if Einstein's right. Do we get a fringe shift? And he did. C plus V is not equal to C, is not equal to C minus V. Einstein's wrong. Problem, that means the Earth stands still. Michelson did another experiment. This time with a chap called Gale. He did this in Chicago. It's actually a very large apparatus, about a kilometer in length, kilometer in width. And the idea is that this beam, this section of his circuit, is closer to the equator than that. So the ether drift that it's going against is different, the speed there and the speed there. So one should get a fringe shift if there is an ether and if C plus B is equal to C minus B. So he did the experiment and he found a fringe shift. C plus B is not equal to C, is not C minus B. Einstein wrong again. How come we always hear about Einstein? We never hear about Sanyak. We never hear about Michelson and Gale. Well, the next person to make an input to this story is Edwin Hubble. You've probably heard of the Hubble telescope. Well, this is not the Hubble telescope. This is the telescope that Edwin Hubble worked on. And he found that 
the further a galaxy appeared to be, i.e. the fainter it is, therefore presumably the further away it is, the more its spectrum was shifted towards the red end. And this <coughs> is so whatever direction he pointed his telescope. So all around the Earth, the further away you go, the more red shifted the spectrum. The Earth is surrounded by concentric shells of redshift. Now, everybody said this must mean that everything is rushing away from us. And the further they are away, the faster they're going away from us. It's called the Doppler effect. That means the Earth is a center from which everything is expanding. Now, people don't like the Earth being the center of anything. So there was a found a way to use Einstein's funny mathematics to explain this all away so that ah, we can still have this redshift but the Earth is still not the centre. But there were observations made of the density of the matter in the universe and it was found to everybody's surprise that the Earth is in the densest part of the universe and as you go away there's less and less material. So the Earth is at the center of the material of the universe. Well, nobody liked this. So they decided to apply a dimming factor to alter the results to make it all even, because they want the Earth to be just any old ordinary place, so there ought to be an even distribution. So they applied dimming factors. They found all they could do was now make the Earth in the least dense part of the universe and the density gets greater as you go away, but the Earth still ends up in the center. Then they discovered what are called mega walls across the cosmos. Now, this was discovered in 1990, and the editor of Science Frontiers wrote an editorial in which he said, wouldn't it be hilarious if the Earth were at the center of these concentric shells? Some measurements of the universe's rotation also seem to imply geocentrism. It looks as if wherever you look, all the evidence is pointing to the Earth being at the center. Well, what about these concentric shells? A research program was set up called the Sloan Sky Survey. And if you like, you can go to their website and you'll see pictures like this. And we are here, and this is a, a, a slice of a view out into space and you can see these mega walls across the cosmos that the editor of Discover was talking about and if you complete the picture you can see these mega walls are going all the way around and we of course are right here there's the same problem when we come to quasars nobody really knows what quasars are but it's been discovered there are several different spectral types and all of them lie on concentric shells centered on the Earth. Y.P. Varshney is a well-known astronomer, and in Astrophysics and Space Science, which is one of the most prestigious journals of astronomy, he said the cosmological interpretation of the redshifts in the spectra of quasars leads to yet another paradoxical result, namely that the Earth is the center of the universe. Two years ago, Blake Temple and Joel Smaller produced a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in which they said the only way we can explain dark energy is for the Earth to be the center of the universe. Now, of course, these people don't accept it. They, s they look for an ad hoc to explain it away. Then there's another problem. It's called the Pioneer Anomaly. Now, this is one of the pioneers before it was launched. It's a space probe. But the pioneer anomaly doesn't only apply to the pioneer probes. It applies to the Ulysses probes, the Voyager probes. Perhaps the most famous of the probes is this Voyager. And you'll probably recognize that gold plate there. A lot of input from Carl Sagan. 
the idea was that voyage, this voyager was supposed to head out of the solar system towards another star. I think it was Arcturus. And Carl Sagan was so confident there would be intelligent civilizations around other stars that he had this plate made and that explains to the people who find it exactly who lives on Earth. But the problem is the astronomers now doubt that he will ever leave the solar system. It looks as if it's going to stop and come back down and crash into the sun. Because all of these space probes are behaving in the same way. They've sent them all different directions. And yet every single one of them seems to be slowing down. They send a radio beam when it is received by the probe. It sends a return beam, and the time it takes for the beam to go there and back, they use to measure the distance. And the distance appears to be getting smaller than it should be. They are getting their signals back quicker than they should. And they say, this means they must be slowing down. It appears there is a force pushing them back to the Earth. And they're in all different directions, all of them have got this force pushing it back towards the Earth, slowing it down, so it will never leave the solar system. It will slow down and stop and then fall in. Now, I personally believe they are wrong. I personally am convinced that the further you go away from the Earth in any direction, the greater the speed of light. Because free space the ether, whatever you want to call it, becomes less dense and light travels quicker in it. So the reason they're getting their signals back to the soon is because the light is traveling quicker than they thought. Because these are now a long way away from the Earth. But whatever the explanation, it's quite clear that the Earth is the center of it all. Well, when we've got one experiment after another, all pointing to the Earth being stationary and everything else moving. Why do we have to keep inventing ad hoc theories to carry on believing that the Earth is moving? Why couldn't we just accept what all the experiments say? Well, I think that A.J. Burgess hit the nail on the head when he said, the story of Christianity tells about a plan of salvation centered upon a particular people and a particular man. As long as someone is thinking in terms of a geocentric universe, the story has a certain plausibility. As soon as astronomy changes theories, however, the whole Christian history loses the only setting within which it would make sense. With the solar system no longer the center of anything, Imagining that what happens here forms the center of a universal drama becomes simply <coughs> silly. And of course the secular humanist doesn't want to lend any support to the Christian history. That's the last thing in the world he wants to support. As Professor J.F. Henry pointed out, the possibility that we have a special place in the universe is depressing to the humanist and is to be absolutely avoided. Well, we might ask, what really is the truth? Is it true that we are just lost in the universe like a grain of sand in the Sahara Desert? Is there really a lot of evidence that proves that? Or could it just be that we really are a very special body in a very special place. Is there a lot of evidence that disproves that? And anyway, does it matter? Well, it turns out that astronomically it makes a huge difference. Because all the measures we have of the universe are based on the idea that the Earth goes around the Sun. Every single method of measurement that the astronomers have is founded on that assumption. 
Now the story goes like this. We've got the Earth going around the Sun and we have a diameter of an orbit of 300 million kilometers. Now we take a photograph of this star here when the Earth is here and we see these stars in the background. When the Earth has gone around to here we take a photo of the same star and we see different stars in the background. And the amount of shift depends on the, on the distance of part of the photographs. So we assume those photographs are taken 300 million kilometers apart and so then we can have a measure to this star. Of course, if the Earth is not going around the Sun, then those photographs are not taken 300 million kilometers apart. And the interpretation of those photographs would be completely different. And we certainly would not have the distance that we work out. Now, the distance isn't important because what these objects are constructed to be depends on how far away they are. The astronomer looks in his, at his photographic plate and he sees this object there and says, well, that's 5,000 million light years away. And in order to be that bright when it's 5,000 million light years away, then it must be a whole galaxy of stars, thousands of millions of them. Now, of course, if it's not 3,000 million light years away, then it would be something completely different. So every single thing the astronomers tell us depends on the Earth going around the sun. And if it doesn't, all their stories, all their distances are completely Well, it makes a big difference to astronomy. Does it make any difference to a Christian? Well, it does. Because, unfortunately, when the people wise with the wisdom of this world decided that the Earth really does go around the sun, they decided that the Bible didn't know what it was talking about. And when Charles Lyell came along with his millions of years, he said, well, the Bible was wrong about the Earth's position. It's also wrong about the Earth's age. And everybody said, oh, yes, well, it was wrong about the Earth's position. I suppose it's wrong about the Earth's age as well. And then, following in his footsteps, when Charles Darwin came along, he said, oh, well, the Bible was wrong about the Earth's position in the creation. It was wrong about the age. It's also wrong about the way the creatures came into being as well. They evolved. They weren't created. And everybody said, oh, well, the Bible was wrong about the position. It was wrong about the age. It must be wrong about this as well. What has happened to our confidence in the inerrancy? Of scriptures. It has been shattered. The Christians failed to realize or failed to value the fact that the whole of the gospel is based on Genesis. Genesis is the foundation and those three attacks were all against Genesis. Where do we get the earth's position from? Genesis chapter 1. Where do we get the earth's age from? the generations in the book of Genesis. Where do we get the origin of the creatures from? Book of Genesis, God made them after their kind. When we attack those things, we are attacking the very basis on which the gospel is founded. Because God's law is founded on Genesis. God has a right and indeed a duty to give us rules to live by because he created us. He's got the right. We are his creatures. And he's got the duty because he can tell us how best to lead this life he gave us. 
Holiness stands on God's law. Doing God's will instead of just satisfying my own selfish desires. Grace stands on holiness because all have sinned and fallen short of the holiness of God. And salvation is the supreme act of grace, of redemption of Jesus Christ. And in allowing Genesis to be attacked, the whole foundation has been destroyed and the church has become a mess. If you look at the church today, it is in a very sorry state. Just look at this country. Not many years ago, we had the liberation gospel. And we've got well-known, world-famous church leaders like Desmond Tutu, firm exponents of the liberation gospel. Then we've got others like Alan Busak, firm exponents of the social welfare gospel. And then we've got the gospel of a good self-image and the gospel of prosperity. And we've got seeker-friendly gospels and emerging gospels and all kinds of perversion. How on earth did this happen? Well, the church is built on the smashed foundation and the doctrines of demons are seeping in all the cracks. But is there anything we can do about it? I believe there is and I believe that Jesus told us what we can do about it. He said we will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless we become as a little child. We need to come as a little child to God's word, accepting it as our Father's instructions for our well-being, accepting that he knew what he wanted to say and how to say it, and that we don't have to twist or turn anything, we just have to read it, believe it, and act on it. If we're prepared to do that, I'm convinced that we could build the church that Jesus came. simple answer is no and you can see that in fact the answer is, is no because it's a, a well known case of relative motion as Fred Hoyle pointed out it's only a matter of relative motion have you ever seen the film 2001 Space Odyssey there is a wonderful illustration in that of relative motion there is a 
space station orbiting the Earth. And there is a spaceship which comes and docks with it. Now this space, space station is rotating so that around the outside you've got gravity. It's not really gravity, it's centrifugal force, but it's just like gravity. So people can walk around there and, and feel quite at home. So when this spaceship comes to dock with it, it's got to rotate. And you see this thing first of all from the point of view of the spaceship. And you can see this thing rotating. And as it comes in to dock with it and it rotates itself, you can see now that it's stationary, everything else in the universe is rotating. But it's only relative motion. Nothing has actually changed. It's only your perspective that's changed. With this, everything works exactly the same as if you were to take, say, Saturn as the center, or the Sun as the center, or the Moon as the center. The relative motions are all the same. The only way you can come to a conclusion is, is not by watching the motion of other bodies. It is by electromagnetic reasons, the, the kind of reason that use Maxwell's, uh, Maxwell's equations. Now there, you don't just have relative mechanical motion. Now you've got something happening which is relative to the ether. So there you can tell whether something's moving or not. But in fact, people don't want to find out whether something's moving or not. Because long ago, people who became convinced that in fact the Earth is stationary, and all the observations are true, and Einstein's relativity explaining them all away is false, said, look, it's easy to prove it. We can make a very small Michelson and Morley interferometer and put it on the space station. We can now measure and see. They said, oh no, we don't want that. <laughs> One gets the impression they know perfectly well that if they did, they'd have the unit disproved and it would be established once and for all that the Earth is stationary. But nobody wants that. Because nobody wants that great fundamental attack on the Bible where it's perfection. Its inerrancy was first attacked. Nobody wants that um, to be disproved. Because if that attack falls, all the other attacks fall as well. It is amazingly important. When Bertrand Russell was involved in his attacks on the Bible, the first thing he did was to say, if we are going to believe the Bible, we have to believe everything it says, including that the Earth is the center of the universe. So now we know it's not the center of the universe, so we know the Bible's not true. The first thing that they attack, I have given lectures all over the place, and I give the lectures on evolution. And as soon as the atheists see they cannot destroy my evolution arguments, they immediately go to Copernicus and Galileo. It's that important. Well, maybe ask the question I asked last week. Um, will the media eat the earth? Uh, I think cause the earth or whatever. Did it go out or not? Did that give any impact to, to the center? Well, that's a good point. The Bible says the earth hangs on nothing. Now, if you hit something that is hanging, well, we can't hang in something on nothing, but we can hang it onto a strip. You know, you can have a bit of wobble, you can have a bit of turning around. It wouldn't surprise me if the earth has got a few sort of wobbles consistent with what you'd expect of something hanging on nothing. If it gets hit, I can imagine it moving and then coming back to equilibrium. I can see a meteorite hitting the Earth having a considerable effect. I can see Dogwell's curve going down there illustrating 
a big effect that the, uh, the, that the Earth was subjected to. Einstein, when he put forward his uh, first paper on general relativity, he said, if the Earth is stationary, then the universe moving around the Earth must create a gravitational field which leads to exactly the same effects. Now, people have calculated the field that would result from the mass of the universe revolving around the Earth. And it creates a gravitational field with the Earth at the center, and it would stabilize the Earth in its position. And if the Earth did get rocking, it would be stabilized back to an equilibrium position. So the mathematics of the Earth being the center is very well understood. And there is nothing that anybody can put forward to say that this effect would not happen because it's been shown that they would happen. In fact, there is a chap called Elmendorf who maybe 20 years ago offered a reward I think $10,000 to anyone who could prove that the Earth moves and another 10000 if they could prove that it rotates. And there have been a number of scientists who have attempted to gain that prize and none of them have put forward a, um, a proof which will stand. They, they all fall, fall to pieces. And if anyone could put forward such a proof, it would immediately prove Einstein wrong. Einstein put forward relativity specifically to counter all the evidence that the Earth moves, and his theory shows that you cannot tell if anything is actually moving or if anything is actually stationary. <laughs> it's a lot of information, and uh, I don't have a scientific background, but I just want to make um, sure, are you saying that oh, the Bible says that the Earth is the center of the universe? The Bible says that the Earth was the first thing created. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Now, if it's the first thing created, then... If it is moving, what's it moving relative to? There's, no, there's nothing else that's been made. There's a spiritual realm which we know nothing at all about. But as far as the physical realm, anything we can measure goes, what can the Earth be moving with respect to? Nothing. If everything else is created around it, if the Earth is going to start moving, then you're going to have a problem with all the, the seas which have been created, washing over and destroying all the plants which have been created. It, it is taken that the Earth goes around the sun at 100,000 kilometers an hour. When did that motion start? Did it start on the fourth day as soon as the sun was created? Because if you start moving the earth at 100,000 kilometers an hour, what's going to happen to all that water? It's going to rush over land at 100,000 kilometers an hour. It's going to destroy everything. And if you start off very slowly and say, all right, then we'll just let it slowly accelerate, well, it's going to fall into the sun because it needs that speed to keep it away from the sun. It, it really doesn't fit. So, if you're going to accept the Earth is there on day three, fully formed as it is now, the sea, the, the land, and everything else created on the fourth day, it has to be created all around it. So it's got to be pretty well on the centre. And NASA, what did I believe? 
Well, it's it's a good question. What it's very difficult to find out what anybody believes, because these days, if you're a scientist and you say what you believe, you can lose your job. You'll certainly lose any chance of promotion. Have you seen the video expert? It's it was on the cinema market about a year ago on the circuit, and it's available at DVD shops. And this shows exactly what happens if a scientist tells you what he really believes. So they keep quiet. They know perfectly well if they don't toe the scientific uh, establishment's line, and they'll be chucked out. So it's very difficult these days to find out what scientists do believe. But I know there are a large number of scientists who are now coming to believe the Earth is stationary at the center. I, I think 30 years ago, there were about four. Now there are a few hundred well-qualified scientists who believe the Earth is the center. But those are just those who will admit it. <laughs> it's very strange because I remember um, I saw something and NASA said uh, they don't have the equipment to search the whole universe. And you can't say something is not the center if you can't even search the whole universe. Yeah. Yes, well, we looked at this on at the second lecture. They have observations of the whole universe. They have observations of the background uh, microwave radiation, which I am quite convinced is the waters above. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, you've got the earth formed from the waters below, space, the firmament, separated the waters above, and we have the sun, the moon, the stars in the firmament between the earth and the waters above. When Penzias and Wilson found a microwave reading of about uh, four degrees absolute everywhere, they had found the water with the waters above. It's everywhere, it's all the same temperature, very cold, it's probably frozen, but there's nothing beyond it. So they have found the outer limit. They don't want to believe that. They say what they, f they say. It is the echo of the Big Bang. What a ridiculous idea. What an utterly stupid idea. They have found the waters above that fits in perfectly with their observations. Now, having found the waters above, they have found the total limit of the physical universe. We don't know what's outside it, except the glory of God. And we only know that because Psalm 8 tells us, it says, Thou hast set thy glory above the heavens. And that's all we know that is beyond it. But that is the outer limit of the physical universe. And they have found it, but they refuse to acknowledge it. I think that's the question I always had, and you said we can get to that in the last time session. Yeah. How big the universe really is? How far does it really stretch us all? That is a very good question, and I can guarantee we will never, ever know. And I can guarantee that because the Bible tells us we will never know. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 31, the whole chapter is telling the children of Israel that God will never reject the seed of Abraham, even though they have disobeyed him. He says he will punish them, but he will never reject them. Look at verse 37. It says, If the heavens above can be measured, or the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, then I will abandon the seed of Israel for all that they have done. The whole chapter tells us he will never abandon them. That verse tells us we will never be able to measure the heavens. In order to measure the heavens, You've got to have some assumption. The way the scientists today is that they make two assumptions. They make the assumption the Earth goes around the sun, 
so that they can triangulate the stars. The second assumption is that the speed of light is constant everywhere in the universe. And on those two assumptions, they build up their whole story. Everything they tell you, all about what these things are, how far away they are, it's all based on those two assumptions. Now, the first assumption that the Earth goes around the sun, the Bible says it's not true. All the observations show it's not true. It's only possible to still believe it by believing Einstein's theories, which as far as I've con I'm concerned have been as thoroughly disproved as any scientific theory can be. But you've still got to believe the Earth goes around the Sun. So that's the first assumption they work on, and I'm convinced that has been not flat. The second assumption, the speed of light is constant, I believe that is almost as thoroughly disproved as Einstein. There are measurements of the speed of light going back into the past, which suggest that it is not constant. There are observations like the Pioneer Anomaly, which on its own wouldn't satisfy me that the speed of light gets faster as you go away from the Earth. But there are so many other observations which are also explained so simply, so easily, so logically, if the speed of light gets greater as you move away from the Earth. But I'm convinced that's true. There are lots of observations which the secular astronomy has to bring in utterly stupid, ridiculous explanations. If the speed of light gets greater as you move away from the Earth, there is an absolutely dead, simple, straightforward explanation. So, both of the assumptions on which astronomy tells you all its distances and its sizes, as far as I'm concerned, are both completely wrong, and the Bible guarantees they're wrong though, anyway. Nobody knows how big, big the universe is. The Bible guarantees we never will know. I personally suspect that it's a lot smaller than the standard story. But I could be wrong. It could be a lot bigger. But one thing I do know, we have got it wrong. Any measurement we take, it is wrong. The Bible guarantees it. Getting back to two pinnacles probably in science or in history, um, two great scientists, uh, Einstein and Newton, the big fight uh, there. Um, many people say Newton was disproved by Einstein, if I'm correct, of the universe. And then, now you're talking about Einstein being disproved. Um, so, all we know from science is they disproved everything <laughs> they believed in the past. But my, my big question is this. Eddington actually uh, proved that Einstein's theory can, could work. I don't know if I'm now saying it correctly. But also, um, there, are some, there were some, uh, probably you could say fraudulent, stuff surrounding that, uh, but that was the big thing. Uh, up till then, Newton was uh, uh, regarded as uh, concerning the laws of the universe. He was, his model was, was always taken. And the people actually, uh, Eddington had a very hard time, even Einstein, um, to prove their theories, until Eddington did the experiment and then disproved Newton, and suddenly the whole concept changed. Look, Newton was a very great scientist. And he never said many of the things that his disciples said. Newton realized that his theories couldn't prove anything absolute. They were all relative. His disciples took it that he could prove, his theories could prove everything absolutely. Newton never had a theory of gravity. He said, the objects in the universe act as if there was a force acting between them. But he said, anybody who knows anything about science knows that this cannot be true. They don't really have a force within themselves. He said, they, they act as if they did. Now, that's true. 
And he spent a lot of time looking for a mechanism by which that could uh, come about. And the only mechanism that he was ever at all convinced about was an idea put forward by the Deye. And his theory was that uh, there were particles moving very quickly. And they bang into everything. He called them ultra-mundane particles. And when two things are like this, then there's lots of these particles hitting them from either side. But each body shields the other one, so they're not getting as many strikes on the sides towards each other. So the strikes on the other side push them together. It's not that these bodies are attracting each other. They are being pushed by all these particles rounding and moving about. Now, Newton thought this was the best idea he had heard put forward. But his theory says everything behaves as if they were attracted by a force uh, equivalent to uh, their masses. But people say, oh, well, Newton said there is a force in these bodies pulling them towards each other. Newton never said that at all. He said nobody with any sound knowledge of science could believe that. It's just useful. And the idea that you can extract some bodies from the universe and then see how they would work under their own gravity and say that's how they do work. That wasn't Newton's idea. He was, his idea was extract it from the, from the universe, see how it works, and that's how they will relatively behave, not how they will behave in the absolute. Now, Einstein's relativity, all the way through it's a fraud. Some of the proofs that he put forward, you can see in his book, um, Relativity, the Special and the General Theories. You don't have to buy that book. You can just go to my website, scriptureandscience.com. I have got a copy on it. And I have got my comments, my annotations, showing you, drawing attention to what he is actually saying and showing how inconsistent it is and showing where the faults are. He specifically says that his theory is, is only there to counter all the evidence that the Earth does not move. He said, we know it moves. All the experiments show it doesn't move. Therefore, we need relativity, which explains why we can't detect that it's moving. And he also, uh, in supporting his, his theories, both special and the general, he points to experiments that are done. And he says, well, that theory also ex explains it. But it's actually my theory which has got the right explanation. He even admits there are other theories which explain those phenomena just as well as his does. And he says the advantage of his theory is it doesn't have any um, excess hypotheses. Now, what he means is it does not try and relate his theory to physical reality. It is just mathematics. The other theories which also explain those experiments, they relate things to reality. So Einstein says, oh, well, they have to have a, uh, other hypotheses. Mine doesn't. So that's why he claims his is a better explanation. But there is no phenomenon at all where Einstein's theories are the only explanation. As far as I'm concerned, there isn't even one observation where Einstein's explanation is anywhere near the best. Now, nobody really accepted Einstein's general theory of relativity until Eddington claimed to have proved it. Now, he took a team, well, in fact, I think he took two teams, to uh, watch a, an eclipse, and he took three telescopes, two quite big ones, reflecting telescopes, 
and one sort of backup telescope, which was a small refractor. And this refractor, he had pointing at a mirror, a plain mirror, which was reflecting the sun. Now, this is known to be very bad experimental practice because the heat of the sun distorts the mirror. In an eclipse, you have the sun shining on the thing, and then when it goes behind the moon's shadow, it's now cooling down. The thing is contracting, and it's deforming and warping. And everybody knows this. So it's not recognized as good practice. And so he had two good-sized reflecting telescopes, and this one backup refractor reflecting, uh, looking at a reflection from the mirror. There were also other big telescopes in the world watching the eclipse. The only set of observations which Eddington could use to prove relativity came from a little four-inch refractor reflecting off the mirror. All the other observations, no chance for supporting Einstein. Now, the fact that he was using suspect equipment immediately alerted some people, and one of the people who was alerted to this was a professor of physics called Charles Lane Poor, an American physicist, and he examined the raw data that Eddington used in his paper which claimed that he approved general relativity. And he found that the movement of the, the stars in the image, they were not consistent with Einstein's relativity at all. Mm -hmm. That Eddington had picked out ones which were in the right direction. The ones that were in the wrong direction, he ignored. But if you take them all in all, all it shows is that the reflecting mirror is distorting and it's moving these, the images around. Now, lots of other eclipses have been watched. None of them have given observations which support Einstein. There have been observed movements of the position of the stars, but they are not the size that Einstein said. They are much closer to predictions made by a German physicist a hundred years before Einstein. He predicted distortion of the star positions purely using Newtonian mechanics. And the measurements that have been actually taken, if they support anybody, they support him, not Einstein. So the whole thing was a fraud, and it was received with such a claim, this was the final proof of Einstein. It wasn't proof at all, it was just fraud. It's interesting that when you get observations of things like um, pulsars. If the behavior does not follow what Einstein said, then if you're lucky, you might find a little report and it's very apologetic and it says, well, unfortunately, the observations don't seem to support relativity. But if you get some observations that do, you get a page of paper. Oh, Observations support Einstein. You know, if you look at enough observations, you'll find eh, some of them will support anybody's theory. Philip, um, gravity. What happens at the borders of Earth and space? Why isn't there? Is there some sort of gravity in space? Obviously, it's less if there is. But what happens at that border? Why isn't there as much gravity in space than on Earth? Oh, well, look, if, if we're looking at Newton's uh, theory of gravity, 
The further you go away from the Earth, the smaller the force, because the force decreases as the square of the distance. So if you go twice as far away, the force is only a quarter. Okay. If you go 10 times away, then the force is only 100. But then, as you get closer to the next body, that gravity starts to dominate, and then you're drawn to, to the other body. So one could say, between the Earth and the Moon, there is a point, it's much closer to the Moon than the Earth, where the Moon starts to pull more than the Earth, and then you will start to fall towards the Moon. They say if we could see all the stars, then there would not be a black spot in the sky because of the stars' lights um, not reaching us. So, is that true? If there are so many stars and we just don't see it, then that also suggests that the universe is much larger than we can even measure it. Or we will be able to measure it, but it's larger than we think. It doesn't necessarily mean that. The story of astronomy is that, as for anywhere you look, if you've got a powerful enough telescope, you will see a star. You just don't normally see it because it's too far away. I don't believe that's true. I don't believe it at all. And I believe that a great deal of what the astronomers are telling us are stars or galaxies are not at all. Because the universe is surrounded by the waters above, which may be frozen, which the astronomers take no account of. They set their telescope up, and they look out into the sky, and they set the exposure running. They don't see these little dots that you find on the, on the photographic plate. They don't see that. If you look through a big telescope, you won't see what we saw on those pictures. You'll see those pictures on a photograph that you leave exposed. The telescope is turning, watching the sky, and it's exposing this photograph for hours. And then you, ex you expose the photograph and you look at it, oh, look at all this. <laughs> now, the thing is, to get that point of light, and it took four hours for it to show up as a point of light, then it must be millions, billions of year, light years away. Now, supposing instead you consider the waters above and you say, well, look, to be that faint, maybe it's because there's a star here and it's light reflected off the waters above and came down into my telescope. Or it reflected off the waters above, it reflected off the waters above, reflected, 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 and then into my telescope then it would really be very faint. Then I would really, my, this must be very, very far away. Which could be a star, say, 60 light days away. But the reflection has gone a long way, and eventually I find it in my telescope. So how many of what the astronomers are telling us are stars, are actually just reflections of things much closer? I don't know. Those fuzzy things that they resolve with their high resolution photographic plates into lots of little dots of light. They say, oh, that must be a galaxy of billions of stars, thousands of millions of light years away. Well, what if the waters above are frozen? slightly crystalline and it, there's a reflection coming up there and it's not from a perfectly smooth mirror, it's got you know, a slight crystal pattern on it which breaks that light up into a lot of little dots and we get it in our, in our photographic plate and it looks like a whole fuzz of dots. Not because it's millions of stars but just because it reflected off a, a crystal structure up there. Everything that the astronomers are telling you is reconstructed from their Big Bang model of the universe. 
that model is wrong. Therefore, everything they're telling you is wrong. To get the truth, we need to look at the truth, which the Bible tells us is the waters above surrounding everything, and say, well, look, to get these pictures, how does that fit in with what the Bible says? And you come to a completely different set of possibilities, which the secular astronomy cannot even start to think of. And some of the things that they come up with are utterly, utterly and completely foolish. Have you ever heard about the cyclotron theory? Well, there are cosmic rays reaching the Earth with such high energy they would take the total destruction of a thousand uranium atoms to give them enough energy to travel at that speed. Now, to have what one could say a nuclear explosion, putting all its energy into firing that cosmic ray at the Earth, it would need some kind of a gun. And the only way that the secular astronomers can come up with it is to say, well, there must be magnetic fields around the stars which work like a cyclotron. Now, a cyclotron is a very complex piece of apparatus which accelerates particles by using very powerful magnetic fields switching them on and off at the right time to continuously accelerate a particle so that it goes faster and faster. It's extremely complex. It's very high precision stuff. And this must have happened just by chance in the dust around the star. You know, what an utterly stupid idea. Well, you know, if you've got their idea, if you've got their, their worldview, a big bang, you know, everything is just expanding and well, what else have you got? You've got to come up with a stupid idea like this. With the biblical model you come up with a perfectly simple explanation of those uh, cosmic rays with the high energy. No problem at all. So what's the word is about again? I don't know. I don't think I heard of it before. Maybe I just... The word is about... Yeah. Ah, well, we need to read Genesis chapter 1 again. But, um, well, read Genesis chapter 1 with your eyes wide open, forgetting about everything the secular humanists have taught you in, at school, at university, everywhere, on the television. Just look at what the Word of God says and see what it tells you. It is deeply explained in that question and answer session, I think, in... Lecture number two. I can make another comment. Um, in the Bible, in Genesis 1 1, it says, In the beginning, God created heaven. Yeah? Which does not say necessarily when it was, could have been a million years ago, four billion. Uh, and then in verse 2, it says, And God's spirit went over the water, and then it started with creation. Now, when he created Adam, the devil, or Satan, was already fallen. How do you know? Well, he was Satan at the time. He was Satan at the time that he when? came to tempt Adam, but how long had Adam been there? We don't know. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. But, um, and Jesus said he saw Satan fall to earth uh, like lightning which might have happened before the creation, or you can say recreation. Some Bibles speak about recreation at the beginning. Not if there are direct translations of the Hebrew. So, so well, I'm not a, a scholar of Hebrew, but uh, so it could be, and it also specifies in, in Isaiah that uh, Satan was a ruler over nations. It's and so forth. Sorry? Is there is. Fair enough. But on earth. So so you can argue that 
Earth was there long ago. Uh, it, it was created in the beginning by God, whether that was 4 billion years ago or not, or whatever method God used. I'm not a, a, a evolution a theorist or whatever, but it could be that Earth has been there for a long time. It was then destroyed, maybe with the fall of Satan or something or other, whatever. And then when Adam was created, Satan was all, I mean, six days later, Satan was there already, Satan. So the argument, uh, you, you can argue that. Oh, you can argue. Unfortunately, I haven't got my Bible with me. Uh, it's a very interesting thing to do to go through Genesis chapter 1. I have on his cell phone. Have you got No. A genuine Bible. I've got an online version. A what? Online. Have you got a genuine Bible or a corruption like <laughs> a message or a, a new international perversion or something like that? I can do you want the English one? Do you have an authorized? It's a KJV complete. Fine. Go Bible. Um, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, I would suggest that that is a heading. Now, it may not be, but I'll give you my reasons for thinking it is shortly. But there are plenty of examples of, of things starting off with a heading. Um, the word there for heaven, it is the Hebrew word shamayim, which is in the dual, just as a pair of trousers or a pair of scissors in the dual. You have one thing with two aspects in that. So heaven is the word shamayim, and the earth Ha'aretz. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now it's interesting that that immediately wipes out the Big Bang Theory. Because the first material that's mentioned here is water. The Big Bang requires the first thing that's produced is hydrogen. And this hydrogen has to collect into stars, and you've got to have nuclear reactions going on, which eventually build up oxygen. And then when stars explode, those which become supernovas, you have these elements thrown about the universe, and then at last, now, you can have hydrogen combining with oxygen, and you can get water. Millions and millions of years after the Big Bang, so here we've got a direct refutation of the Big Bang Theory because the first thing that's mentioned here is water. Sorry to, to interrupt, but the assumption that you are making is that that water was in the deformed Earth. But uh, it could be that the Earth was destroyed with water, again with water, the second time with, with Noah. Well, let's carry on and see if that's okay. possible. Okay. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the day, the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now you see this light that he creates, it's, there's no light bearer there. It doesn't say he created uh, a sun, or a star, or a flashlight. He creates light, but there's no light there. And this light defines time. Until that light is created, there is no definition of time. What happened had no measure. That measure is determined by the light. Now, what on earth that could be, is a difficult question because science can't tell us what light is. Science can tell us some things about what life does, but what life is, it's a mystery. There are some observations which can only be explained if light is some kind of a wave motion, waveform. But then, to be a waveform, it has to have a medium to travel through. And there are other 
observations which can only be explained if light is like a particle. So you've got a whole stack of experiments. Light has to be some kind of a wave. You've got a whole stack of experiments where it appears light has to be a quantum, some kind of a particle. And it doesn't help to try and combine them and say, well, light must be a wavicle, because there aren't any experiments which are explained by a wavicle. So what does this tell us? Well, we don't know what light is. So what this light was that God created, we don't know, but we do know that it defines time. Until this light was defined, there's no day, there's no night, there's no, there's no time measure. Now, it's hard to see how this can be, but the way I visualize it is this. If God created this light in some kind of a circuit, and it takes one day to go around this circuit, we now have a definition where the light is, it's day, where it's not, it's night, and we have a definition of this time, day. So it's after he creates the light that he can say, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So how long he, he was hovering over the waters, it doesn't, it's not a meaningless, not a meaningful question. Because the measure, the means of measuring this light, this night and day, is only um, created, and then one can talk about a day. And God said, let it be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. You'll notice we still only have one physical material, water. And he creates something else called the firmament. I don't think we're in a position yet to decide what that is. But it's somewhere in the midst of the waters, dividing <coughs> the waters below it from the waters above it. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, it's interesting here, This, the firmament he makes on the second day, and that is this heaven, the word Shamayim, the same one that we find in verse 1. So this is one of the reasons I think the first verse is a heading. In the beginning he made heaven and earth, and the heaven he made on the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Now, here we've got something interesting. We've got water below, water above, the firmament in between, and in the water below, he says, let dry land appear. And the dry land does appear. And this reminds me of Jesus' first miracle. What was the first thing Jesus did? He took water and he made something else from it. Wine in this case. And it looks here as if the original material is water, and God creates land, dry land, out of the water, and that fits in very well with 2 Peter chapter 3, where it says God created the earth out of the water and standing in the water, whereby the world that then was, was overflowed. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth, Haaretz. That's also, what we find in verse 1, God in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And here we have the heaven created on day 2, the earth created on day 3. Now, I may be wrong about that, but that's the way in reading it, I see it. And the gathering together of the waters called the seas, and God saw that it was good, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass. And herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after its kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after its kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. 
So by the end of the third day, we have got the waters below the firmament now transformed pretty well into the earth as we know it now. It's got land, it's got the sea, it's got trees, um, plants. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So here we have now an indication of what this firmament is. It's the place where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. It's what we today would call space. So we've got the waters below turned in the earth much as we know it now. Space, then the waters above, and now we've got the sun, the moon, and the stars. And they are for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. Now, days are defined by that light that God created on the first day. But it would appear to me from this that we cannot see that light. Maybe it is of a wavelength we are not sensitive to. Maybe it is outside the waters above and therefore is not visible for some reason. But it appears that the sun, the moon and the stars are set there for a time measure that we can see. And presumably, they are in synchronous um, movement with the fundamental time-defining light that was created on the second day. So here we've got a huge problem for any idea about a destruction of, of the Earth before the first day. Because after, the, after that, in the beginning, all we've got is water. And it's not just that we've got an earth that's covered with water, we've only got water. And the firmament is created in the midst of this water, and then in, in several places it says God created the firmament and stretched it out. So this firmament is surrounded by the water above and the earth is only turned into the earth after this separation has taken place between the waters above by space and then there is no sun, moon, star. So if there was any sort of existence before day four, it was entirely in the dark and could not have lasted very long. Now, he created the plants on the first day. It's quite possible for plants to go for a day with no light. It's not possible for plants to go much longer with no light. So we're not talking here about uh, some enormous period of time because those plants would not survive with no sun. Um, now, we're faced here with a cosmology which is utterly and completely different to the cosmology that the secular humanists put forward. It's completely different to the cosmology that we are taught in school, the cosmology we are brought up on. Utterly and completely different. We have got the Earth, we have got space around it with the sun, moon and stars, and we've got the waters above and what have we got above that? Well, the, I only find one place in the Bible where it tells us what's above. Because in Psalm 8 it says God has set his glory above the heavens. And probably the reason why we can't see it is it's the other side of the waters above. Now, the waters above are only mentioned as far as I can remember, in one other place, that's in Psalm 148, where it's calling upon the whole of creation to praise God. 
And he says, praise him, you heavens of heavens, praise him, you stars of light, and praise him, ye waters that be above the heavens. And we've had amazing proof that they're still here now. Because in, I suppose it would be in the 1970s, Penzias and Wilson, two very famous scientists, built a detector. And they wanted to scan the skies for microwave sources. They thought, well, there are X-ray sources, there are light sources, maybe there are microwave sources. So they built their antenna and pointed at the sky, hoping to find <coughs> little points where they got microwave uh, emissions. But to their surprise, they found everywhere they pointed this antenna, there was a uniform microwave emission at just over two degrees absolute. That's extremely cold. Minus 270 degrees. Everywhere. And they were amazed. They said, well, what can this be? How on earth can there be this uniform background and everywhere the same temperature? Now, obviously, they found the waters above. They found this water is uniform. It's at a uniform temperature now. But only two degrees absolute. It's probably frozen solid. But there it is. But what did the scientific establishment say? They said, oh my, what can this be? Oh yes, this must be the echo of the Big Bang. Now, did you know <laughs> that an explosion could leave an echo two degrees above absolute zero everywhere, totally uniform? Well, this idea is very popular, but there's, there are enormous problems for it. They've tried to fit this into the Big Bang story, but the problem is the universe is full of galaxies and stars and things which are not uniform at all. And if there were such a thing as an echo from the Big Bang, it would not be uniform at all. It would have the imprint of stars and galaxies on it. So it's very obvious what it is. It's the waters above. But you won't find the scientific community accepting that. They will, they will carry on with fairy stories like echoes of Big Bang. Uh, are you familiar with the uh, uh, Coriolis effect? Yes. Uh, what is that? It just explain this. I've heard about it, but I don't know what Well, it is a, a gravitation effect, which includes rotation. Now, when you look at the universe, rotating around the Earth, it produces a gravitational field which has a normal component, it has several other co rotational components like the Coriolis effect. Now, in Newtonian mechanics, you explain the Coriolis effect by the Earth turning. If you, uh, if you consider the Earth and it's rotating, then the, cent the equator is going at about a thousand kilometers an hour. Whereas the pole is just turning, but it's not going any speed at all. And anywhere in between, there is an intermediate speed. So if you were to fire a projectile from the equator towards the pole, it starts off with a component of velocity east-west of a thousand kilometers an hour. Now, as it goes further north, it is traveling over uh, land which has a smaller speed. So it doesn't go in a straight line towards the north, it veers off because it's going faster, it has a faster co uh, component east-west from the ground underneath it. And that's called the Coriolis effect. In looking from the ground, it appears that it bends. Now, it's the same with 
the winds. If you have air rising at the equator and moving towards the poles, it has a speed of a thousand kilometers an hour when it's near the ground at the equator. It goes up and as it goes towards the pole, the land underneath has a lower speed, so it appears to be moving off. And that's called the Coriolis effect. In Newtonian mechanics, it is a fictitious force. There appears to be a force pushing it away from the straight line. That's called the Coriolis force. Um, when something is going in a circle, there is a there appears to be a centrifugal force, a force pushing it away from the center. Now, in Newtonian mechanics, those are fictitious forces. There is no such force. It's an effect. When you consider the universe rotating, those are real forces because they are generated by the rotating mass of the universe. 